You are listening to The Evidence Locker. Our cases have been researched using open source and archive materials. It deals with true crimes and real people. Each episode is produced with the utmost respect to the victims, their families, and loved ones. When British-born businessman Neil Haywood was found deceased in his hotel room in China's megacity Chongqing on November 14, 2011, it appeared as if he had died due to an overdose. Pills were strewn all around the room. Neil had called China home for the last two decades of his life and worked as an intermediary, linking Western companies to Chinese politicians with decision-making power. His untimely death came as a shock to his family. When they heard that the official cause of death was a heart attack due to excessive drinking, something did not seem quite right. Neil was only 41 years old and in good shape. What made it even more suspicious was that Neil was never a heavy drinker. They knew he had fallen onto hard times in the years before, as he had to close down his business. But Neil was a survivor, and he had managed to get back on his feet in the time leading up to his death. He had a wife and two daughters and nobody believed that he would have ended his own life. Neil's body was cremated only three days after he was found. A memorial service was held in London. His Chinese-born wife and two daughters flew to the UK to attend the memorial. Everyone was mystified, reeling in disbelief and shock that Neil was gone. How did this well-connected businessman end up dead in room 1605 at the Lucky Holiday Hotel in Chongqing? more than a thousand miles from his home in Beijing. This was only the beginning of a scandal that would shake Chinese high society and the Communist Party to its core. A story of betrayal, greed, and power unfolded that would change the course of history in China, and arguably, the entire world. Neil Percival Haywood was born October 20, 1970. He grew up in South London. He came from a stable home and always knew that he would one day go to Harrow, a prestigious school his father attended. And like his father, Neil was in the same house, West Acre. Neil did okay at school. His housemaster felt that he could have worked harder, but he got by. He was more of an academic than a sportsman but didn't make great waves academically either. He was rather unassuming and didn't really stand out in a crowd. His housemaster also felt that there was something undefinable about him. He even seemed a bit shadowy at times. After Harrow, he went to the University of Warwick to study international politics. Again, he did not make much of an impression and left little traces of his time spent there. Once he had completed his tertiary education, He went to China to work as an English teacher. He settled in Dalian, a fast-expanding city in the Northeast. It was a strange choice, as there weren't a great many British expats in the provincial city of Dalian at the time. Perhaps he simply went where he could find a job. The handful of expats who met Neil felt that he was elusive. He never made any great comments or contributions. He seemed like he was simply passing through. Not overly ambitious just happy to be where he was. Neil taught English at an elite private school in Dalian and married a local woman called Wang Lu, and they had two children. But despite others' perceptions of him, he had quiet ambitions and saw an opportunity for someone in his position. You see, at the time, in the 1990s, there was a huge commercial boom in China, and British companies were falling over their feet to get in on the action. By 2002, Neil had started a company called Neil Haywood and Associates. He would charge a handsome sum of money to British companies who wanted to jump onto the bandwagon of business interests in China. He was the mediator, but in order to make a success of his business, he needed to make connections within the Chinese community, especially political figures. 
as they had the power to grant permits and make favorable business decisions. The most powerful man in Dalian was its mayor. Bo Xilai was a flamboyant and powerful man. His father, Bo Yibo, was a founding member of the Communist Party in China, a risky endeavor that came at a price back then. Chairman Mao's men killed Bo Xilai's mother, and both Bo Yibo and a young Bo Xilai were sent to prison. But when the political climate changed in China, Bo's father became a well-respected man who played an integral role in the Cultural Revolution. Bo Xilai always believed that he was destined to be great. He did not want his parents' sacrifices to go in vain. He was a charismatic speaker with forward-thinking ideas. This was at the time when China was making waves on the international stage as a growing commercial giant. Bo Xilai was the right person at the right place at the right time. He quickly rose through the ranks and became mayor of Dalian and governor of Liaoning. His reforms put Dalian on the map, and international people looking for business opportunities flooded into Dalian. Bo Xilai was a married man when he met a young and ambitious woman called Gu Kailai. He realized that she could be more than just a lover. She could be the ally he needed to rise to the top. Bo left his wife and restarted his life with Gu Kailai. They married and had a son, Bo Kuangyi, or Gua Gua as he was better known, in 1984. Gu Kailai was the youngest of five daughters of General Gu Jingcheng, a revolutionary in the years before the Chinese Communist Party took over. Once the Communist Party was in power, in the beginning, General Gu held many positions in government. Like Bo Xilai's father, Gu Kailai's dad was also imprisoned during the Cultural Revolution. Gu Kailai herself was only a child, but she was also punished and forced to work in a butcher shop and a textile factory. That was not the life she wanted for herself. As the political change came about, she was able to get herself into Peking University. This is a very prestigious college, say like the Harvard of China. Gu Kailai obtained a degree in law and a master's degree in international politics. She was a strong and feisty woman and determined to make it big. After her studies, she founded the Kailai Law Firm in Beijing. Her firm handled many high-profile cases. Gu Kailai made her mark when she represented several Dalian area companies involved in a dispute in Mobile, Alabama. The case made Gu Kailai the first Chinese lawyer to win a civil lawsuit in the United States. She went on to write a book, Uphold Justice in America, about how she had won the lawsuit. Gu Kailai was outspoken and had inherited her father's revolutionary spirit. She publicly commented on U.S. judicial systems, as well as faults in both American and Chinese systems. To Bo Xilai, Gu Kailai was the perfect partner to be by his side as he rose through the ranks of the Communist Party. Gu Kailai closed her practice to focus all of her time on raising their son, Gua Gua, and supporting her husband's rising career. Some people referred to them as the John and Jackie Kennedy of China, the ideal first family of Dalian. To the people of Dalian, Bo Xilai was a hero. He commissioned the first five-star hotel to be built and planted green patches with grass and trees to make the city more attractive. He opened several museums, supporting the arts and culture of the whole region. Suddenly, Dalian was a nice place to be, and the people loved Bo Xilai for it. And he knew how to spread the love. When he drove through the streets and people recognized him, he would get out of his luxury vehicle and greet the people. He was one of Dalian's citizens. With a large portion of the community living in poverty, Bo Xilai reformed welfare programs. Everybody loved him. He became the star of the Chinese New Left, composed of Maoists and Social Democrats. They were critical of capitalism and encouraged state ownership of businesses. There was also a strong renewal of collective spirit, where the good of the community comes before the aspirations of the individual. But despite outward appearances, the marriage between the mayor and his wife was not a happy one. Gu Kailai felt lonely and depressed. Bo Xilai had multiple affairs and one-night indiscretions. But if Gu Kailai wanted to retain her position as the mayor's wife, she knew that she had to turn a blind eye to her husband's infidelity. She kept up appearances and focused all of her attention on their son, Gua Gua. 
A close family friend revealed that Gu Kai Lai once tried to commit suicide, but she only did it to get Bo's attention. She drank a lot and used sleeping tablets to fall asleep. Eventually, she decided to beat Bo at his own game and started a string of affairs herself. She used men when it suited her. If they could do something for her, she would sleep with them. Chinese elite all moved money out of the country and invested it in property in the West. It was also pretty much the done thing to give your children an expensive, A-list Western education. Despite their separate private lives, both Bo Xilai and Gu Kai Lai were still committed to boost his public profile. Another check in the box would be to have their son educated with the world's elite. Gu Kai Lai took it upon herself to see to it that Gua Gua received the best education possible and moved to England in 1999. Mother and son lived in a flat in Bournemouth, where Gua Gua attended an English language school. It was in this time that Neil Haywood met the powerful first couple of Dalian at the Royal China Club in London. He was well spoken and made a good impression on them. Both Bo Lai and Gu Kai Lai felt that they could trust him, and perhaps more importantly, use him. Neil had connections to British high society and could possibly make many lucrative connections for them. Neil became Gua Gua's guardian or mentor. He was the perfect candidate, seeing as he used to go to Harrow, lived in Dalian, and he used to be a teacher. He helped Gua Gua to navigate his way in British high society, making connections while he had the opportunity to attend an elite school. It was also alleged that Neil helped the family move large amounts of money out of China. Before long, Neil Haywood had worked his way into the powerful inner circle of Dalian's top family. During her time in England, Gu Kai Lai kept herself busy by making business deals to shield the movement of money between the UK and China. Neil Haywood served as one of her intermediaries at that time, negotiating with British businesses on her behalf. Some said that it was thanks to Neil that Gua Gua was accepted at the prestigious Harrow. But close family friends say that Gua Gua had already been allocated a spot by the time Neil became close to the Bows. Gu Kai Lai could be dangerous and threatening if business associates did not want to play ball. BBC's Kerry Grace interviewed local businessman Giles Hall. He said that Gu Kai Lai had asked him to pay Gua Gua school fees through his company. She would then compensate him in cash. Giles refused, and she threatened him, saying that her friend in Dalian was the chief of police, and if Giles ever went to China, she would have him thrown in jail. Giles Hall also witnessed the working relationship between Neil Haywood and Gu Kai Lai, and found it to be volatile. Gu Kai Lai did not trust Neil completely. He would transfer large amounts of money to her connections all over the world, and she was always suspicious that he didn't transfer the specified amount. Gu Kai Lai had the feeling that Neil transferred less money so he could pocket the rest. Neil was adamant that he would never do anything of the sort. With all matters, he stood his ground with Gu Kai Lai and once said to Giles Hall that if she ever crossed him, he would have her throat cut. He knew everything about the family's money movement in and out of China. When, how much, and exactly where it all went. If he ever had his back to the wall, he would dish the dirt without batting an eye. Back in Dalian, Bo Xilai was on a mission, uplifting the poor, beautifying the city, and boosting arts and culture were golden ways of ensuring he would always be remembered as Dalian's most influential mayor. And as a curator of all things beautiful, Bo Xilai wanted Dalian to host an annual fashion show. To draw beautiful women to Dalian, he also opened a modeling school in town. He made sure that he was always surrounded by beautiful women, but far from being simply a handsome playboy, Bo Xilai had a dark side. When models started to disappear, one after the other, rumors were whispered around town. It could never be substantiated, but there was a dark cloud of suspicion over the mayor that he had something to do with each of their disappearances. Despite this, Bo Xilai was untouchable. The fact that his father was one of the founding members of the Communist Party meant that he had doors open to him which made for a smooth sailing career as a politician in the People's Republic of China. He was on track to become a senior member of the party. Gu Kai Lai kept a close eye on Bo's career from England. 
and realized it was time to move back to China to support her husband in stepping up on the political ladder. Bo was making himself noticed in the Communist Party. It was no surprise when he was appointed Minister of Commerce in 2004. And the family relocated to Beijing, into the heart of all the action of national politics. This meant that he was a key figure for British companies looking to invest in China. Because things in China work quite differently to the UK, someone like Neil Haywood was an invaluable resource to many British companies. Neil realized that he had struck gold in his already established connection with Bo Xilai and followed him to Beijing. Bo Xilai's success meant big things for Neil's future as a mediator. But Neil also knew how to play the game. He was discreet and elusive, and his quiet confidence made British companies believe that he was the right person to introduce them to the relevant political leaders. He intrigued people with his mysterious demeanor. Some people believed him to be a spy. He did supply a constant stream of information to a company set up by former MI6 operatives, but he was never employed as such. He was a Briton in the thick of Chinese politics, and British intelligence would have been interested in what he knew as well. But they would never confirm that they had anything to do with Neil Haywood. Neil, however, loved the speculation about his clandestine life as a spy. He embraced it to the degree that he ordered personalized number plates for his S-Type Jaguar, flashing the numbers 007, and a Union Jack sticker to go with it. Rumors were also floating about town that Neil was having an affair with Gu Kai Lai. But people in the inner circle who knew the truth found it all to be a bit far-fetched. Neil was mostly a part of Guagua's life, in the most mundane way. He was assisting Guagua in administrative issues regarding his schooling and so on. In reality, he was also not as close to Bo Xilai as he would make British businesses believe. He only met the high-flying Bo a handful of times. Bo Xilai was getting noticed as someone who marched to the beat of his own drum. This did not go down all that well with the Communist Party. The perfect party member would be happy to comply with all the rules and regulations of the party. But Bo was different. He had progressive ideas and did not follow orders and protocol as expected. Because of the legacy left by his father in the Communist Party, Bo Xilai was untouchable. But all of this changed when his father passed away in 2007. Bo was no longer in favor. He was removed as Minister of Commerce and transferred to the megacity of Chongqing to be party secretary. This was a big blow to Bo Xilai. He had been ousted from the power center of China. In a sense, he was forced to start over as Chongqing was nowhere near Dalian or Beijing, and he was alone in a city he did not know. The move also had a devastating effect on Gu Kailai. She became paranoid and neurotic. She kept looking over her shoulder as she felt she was being betrayed by someone in her inner circle. She had good reason to be paranoid too. She was in fact being poisoned slowly. Her herbal health supplements had been laced with mercury. It caused her to look worn out and tired. Mercury is a very cruel choice of poison. If someone were to ingest too much mercury, symptoms would include muscle weakness, a lack of motor skills, changes in vision, hearing, or speech, bouts of anxiety, and mood swings. The case was handed to the Beijing police in December 2007. After a short investigation, Gu Kailai's driver and a house servant were arrested on suspicion of poisoning their employer. They said they were acting on the orders of Bo Xilai's son from his first marriage. He wanted revenge on Gu Kailai for breaking up his parents' marriage. Bo's son denied the allegations, and with no substantial evidence against him, he was never charged. Unfortunately for Gu Kailai, the poisoning had a lasting physical effect. It was like she had a terminal illness. In dealing with it, she withdrew from everyone in her life. She refused to see friends and connections, and she even gave up her cell phone. All this while Bo Xilai's career was in the gutter, and he had to start over again in Chongqing. Most of his peers in the Communist Party thought that they had seen the last of him. The general feeling was that a disgraced Bo would wither away in Chongqing and never be able to claw his way back to the power center in Beijing. 
but giving up was simply not in Bo Xilai's nature. He used his time in Chongqing to make his mark yet again and vowed to get back to Beijing stronger and more powerful than ever before. To show how fearless he could be, he took a strong stand against organized crime in Chongqing. His tactics made him many enemies, however. He used his reckless police chief, Wang Lijun, to head up his war against organized crime families. Everybody seemed to be under threat from Bo Xilai and his police chief. Some of the most prominent businessmen were intimidated and even arrested if they questioned Bo Xilai's power or methods. Businessmen were tortured. A tiger chair was used. The victim is made to sit, tied down, onto the bench. They would be left in this position for more than 20 days, and they received lashes because they refused to admit to crimes they did not commit, such as bribery or fraud. Once someone was found guilty of organized crime activities, the government could legally claim all of their assets. But not all of the people accused were actually crime bosses. Some were super wealthy businessmen, nothing else. In some cases, $100 million was confiscated. The money would be spent on beautifying the city and promoting Bo's other ideals. Some did wonder if all of the confiscated millions went back into the city's funds, or perhaps into Bo's pockets. The public loved it. Bo Xilai had put the super wealthy in their place. He was like their very own Robin Hood. His unrelenting determination to succeed as a politician did not go unnoticed by the Communist Party, and slowly but surely, Bo Xilai was able to fall back into favor with his superiors. So much so, that he was up to be elected as one of only nine members of the exclusive Politburo Standing Committee. This was an amazing feat, considering the fact that just five years before, he was shunned by the party. Back in Beijing, Neil Haywood's business felt the ripple effect of the Bo's departure. He was on the brink of bankruptcy, with unpaid debts in excess of 20,000 pounds. Neil was desperate and used the only lifeline he could think of. He contacted Guagua, who was studying at Oxford University at the time, demanding large amounts of money. He claimed it was compensation for time spent on tasks while serving as Guagua's guardian. During the Beijing Olympics, he met with Gu Kailai and Guagua at a tea house on Tiananmen Square to talk about his monetary claims. The discussion was amicable, and Neil said he did not expect the initial large amount he requested, but that he was desperate and hoped that they would be able to help him out. In the end, he agreed that they would not pay him anything. He understood that he had overplayed his hand. After all, the Bows were his daughter's godparents, and he did not want to ruin the friendship. However, sometime later, a desperate Neil contacted Guagua again, pleading poverty and explaining why he felt the Bows owed him the money. This time, he was adamant and demanded $22 million. In the email, Neil threatened to destroy Guagua if they didn't pay him. He threatened to expose the family's murky overseas investments, totaling in excess of $136 million. When Gu Kailai read the email, she shrugged it off and thought Neil was being ridiculous. But always being proactive in protecting her high-profile family, Gu Kailai filed a police report against Neil Haywood making it clear that they did not owe him anything. The matter was settled amicably. They never went to court, and Neil and Guagua met for a drink in 2011 to clear the air between them. Neil wanted to see Gu Kailai, but Guagua told him about her seclusion and said that she would not see anyone. Despite Neil's financial woes, he would not let it affect his lifestyle. Months before his death, he moved his family into an exclusive gated community on the outskirts of Beijing. His friends claimed that during this time, he was in high spirits and positive about the future. On short notice, he was summoned to go to Chongqing as Gu Kailai agreed to meet with him. Hoping that there could be financial gain in meeting her, he packed his bags and flew to Chongqing. Neil arrived at the Lucky Holiday Hotel on the night of the 13th of November, 2011. He was not sure why he was asked to go there, and felt uneasy when he didn't hear from Gu Kailai. From his hotel room, he called one of his connections in Chongqing and said that something was not right. 
and he felt like he was in trouble. Two days later, Neil Haywood's body would be discovered on his bed in his hotel room. The events that followed drew unwanted international attention to conflict within the Chinese Communist Party. It would expose many secrets and turn allies against each other. Neil's cause of death was ruled to be heart failure due to excessive drinking. His family agreed that he could be cremated three days after his body was discovered. Hard as it was to accept, it was a tragedy and no amount of questions could ever bring Neil back. Bo Shilai was probably not shedding too many tears. At the time of Neil Haywood's death, Bo was counting the days until the announcement of his promotion to the much-coveted Politburo Standing Committee. He was expected to be appointed as vice president, a very powerful position on the international political stage, but it was not destined to be. It all came undone for Bo Shilai, thanks to the Wang Lijun incident. Wang Lijun is a colorful character, and a lot of the following information comes directly from his statements and recollection of events. Some people challenge the truth of his story, but we'll go into that after Wang Lijun's version of events is told. Bo appointed Wang Lijun soon after arriving in Chongqing. Being police chief of a megacity like Chongqing was a big deal. The city has 30 million residents. If you compare it to the less than 10 million people of New York, you get a better idea of the tremendous size of Chongqing. Wang Lijun's reign as police chief was an interesting one for sure. Wang Lijun was the type of police chief who insisted on going to crime scenes himself, showing up in his jeep with spotlights and shooting a rifle into the air, making it known that he had arrived. He conducted autopsies himself. He made it a point to watch all executions and supervised organ harvesting of prisoners who were executed. He was wild and he was unpredictable. The perfect match for someone like the unconventional Bo Shilai. But things between the two men went very wrong. And in February 2012, the year following Neil's death, Wang Lijun did the unthinkable. In the cover of night, he disguised himself as an old woman. And with the protection of security guards, drove the 200 miles to the American consulate in Chengdu to seek political asylum. He said that he feared for his life. American consulate officials heard his intriguing story. Wang Lijun claimed to have information about both Bo Shilai and his wife and the murder of British businessman Neil Haywood, who had financial ties to the couple. Police chief Wang Lijun claimed that there was a dispute between Gu Kailai and Neil Haywood and that he was poisoned. Wang Lijun said that Gu Kai Lai was not in a good place. She was on a multitude of drugs and antidepressants and suffered from insomnia. After Neil Haywood sent threatening emails to her son, she summoned Haywood to meet her in Chongqing. Wang Lijun claimed that on the 13th of November, 2011, Gu Kai Lai and Neil Haywood had dinner, then went to his room for a nightcap. Her assistant waited outside the door. In the hotel room, they had whiskey and tea. Neil got drunk and vomited, asked for some water, and then passed out. When Neil was unconscious, Gu Kai Lai then forced animal poison down Neil's throat. Before she left, she planted pills all over the room to make it look like he had overdosed. Along with her assistant, they dragged Neil's body onto the bed, then put a do not disturb sign on the door when they left. That was a serious accusation. To accuse the wife of one of the most powerful men in China of murder. Wang Lijun continued his version of events and told officials at the American consulate in Chengdu that he had confronted Bo Shilai about suspicions he had against Gu Kailai. Not having much of a choice, Bo then gave him the green light to conduct an investigation. However, Bo Shilai went back on his word and made the investigation impossible. Wang Lejun, who had been a pivotal player in Bo Shilai's comeback, was suddenly demoted as police chief and given the position of vice mayor overseeing education, science, and environmental affairs. Bo Shilai also placed Wang Lejun under surveillance. Word got out that he had planned to have Wang assassinated. 
Wang Lejun claimed that he carried on with the investigation on his own time, being as discreet as possible so as to not get caught. He contacted Dr. Henry Li, a leading Chinese forensic expert living in the U.S., to discuss the case. You might know Dr. Li from the CBS documentary miniseries, The Case of John Benet Ramsey. Wang Lijun told Dr. Li that he managed to take blood samples from Neil Haywood before he was cremated and that he wanted him to look at it. The arrangement was that two of Wang Lijun's trusted men would take the blood samples to JFK, but they never showed up. In fact, they were arrested by Chongqing police before they could board the plane. Wang Lijun would claim that he went to Bo Xilai again and told him about the evidence he had gathered Proving his wife had murdered Neil Haywood, Wang Lejun said that Bo Xilai punched him in the face so hard that liquid came from his ear. Then he smashed the glass on the floor. But he was not mad because his wife had murdered Neil Haywood. Instead, he was furious that his once loyal police chief did not cover up the crime. Bo Xilai knew that if the information fell into the wrong hands, his career would be over. Wang was denied asylum in the U.S., and left the consulate on his own volition. He refused to leave before security forces from Beijing came to protect him. Wang Lijun wrote an open letter to overseas Chinese-language news outlets in which he calls Bo the greatest gangster in China. Bo Xilai supporters in the Communist Party turned against him. Not sure what exactly the information was that Wang had given the U.S. consulate. The damage was done, and someone had to pay the price. Party members do not defect. End of story. Bo Xilai was removed as party chief of Chongqing and lost his membership of the Politburo Standing Committee on the same day the Chinese authorities revealed the truth of Neil Haywood's death. He did not die of natural causes. He was murdered. The main suspect was none other than Bo Xilai's wife, Gu Kailai. Bo was later expelled from the party. Professor Steve Sang from the University of Nottingham explain the feelings of the nine-seat Politburo Standing Committee regarding Bo Xilai. Somebody like Bo Xilai is an unguided missile who could hit you as much as he could hit your political opponents. On the 10th of April, 2012, Gu Kailai was taken into custody at her home in Chongqing. Remember, she had been living in seclusion for many years, only leaving her home on her own terms. Police had to knock down the bedroom door before they let her away. In the People's Republic of China, if a senior government official or any member of his or her family faces a trial, the process has to be guided by the Communist Party. On the 9th of August, 2012, Gu Kailai admitted during her one-day trial, it was only seven hours to be exact, that she was responsible for Neil Haywood's murder. She killed him because he threatened her son. She explained that she was suffering a mental breakdown at the time of the murder and said that she would accept and calmly face any sentence. Her statement, I feel that the court decision is fair. It has overall shown our court's respect of law, the respect of reality, especially the respect of life. Because of her intimate knowledge on the inner workings and philosophy of the Communist Party, Gu Kailai knew it would be best for her future to plead guilty and follow the script, so to speak any other way would have resulted in harsher punishment. But the official account of Neil Haywood's death presented at trial had many inconsistencies, and some people wondered if Gu Kailai was actually guilty at all. But on the 20th of August, 2012, she was convicted of murder and given a suspended death sentence. Three years later, it was commuted to life imprisonment. Since then, every person who was implicated in Neil Haywood's death has been arrested or ordered not to speak with the media. Anyone involved were placed under surveillance, even journalists who had covered the story. Folders would disappear from journalists' personal computers. Emails were tracked. Those who knew more than they should have were too scared to admit that they had any knowledge of the murder. There was a sense that her trial was a cameo event to appease the British government who insisted on justice for their murdered citizen. Some people believed that the woman who appeared in court was not even Gu Kailai, but a body double. They claimed that the heavier Gu was not Gu at all, 
as her bone structure and ears did not match earlier photos of her. One can wonder why a body double would have been brought in. What would the purpose be? And who was behind the decision to use a double? Gu herself? Or the Communist Party? Whether it was Gu or not, the body double debate proved that the Chinese public were skeptical about their judicial system. Nobody could ever conclusively confirm or deny whether Gu Kailai was the person who attended her own trial or not. With both Gu Kailai and Bo Xilai behind bars, the question still lingers. Was Gu Kailai framed for Neil Haywood's murder? The question places a large shadow of doubt over the Communist Party's involvement in Neil's murder. From the start, Neil Haywood's murder was tainted with political motives, and the timing of Neil's death was extremely significant. At the time of Neil's death, the Communist Party was about to meet for their 18th Congress. At the Congress, Bo Xilai's promotion to the Politburo Standing Committee was to be announced. This was not a move that everyone in the Communist Party supported. Bo was unpredictable, and that was not a good characteristic for a senior party member to have. But before Bo Xilai could take up his membership, Neil Haywood was killed. One theory goes that Gu Kailai was framed to disgrace Bo Xilai and cause his downfall, preventing him from stepping up on the power scale. At her trial, Gu Kailai's defense team revealed that Gu Kailai told a confidant that Wang Lijun was planting evidence to frame her. The defense also raised questions about the crime scene at the Lucky Holiday Hotel. They claimed that Neil's body had been moved from the time Gu Kailai left the room to the time he was discovered. It was further stated that the crime scene was not properly handled. A window was open, and there was a muddy footprint on the window sill. There was also no post-mortem done before he was cremated. In the United States, for instance, the hotel room would have been cordoned off and been ruled a crime scene that would then be processed by forensic technicians. The defense had many questions that were never answered. Were all liquids in the room tested for poison, for instance? Was there vomit present? But no information about the crime scene was ever presented in court. Wang Lijun testified that he had ordered blood to be taken before Neil's body was cremated. It showed that he was poisoned. He looked at hotel CCTV footage and saw that Gu Kai Lai was the last person to leave Neil's room on the night of the 13th of November. Wang Lijun also said that Gu Kai Lai had confessed to the murder and that he had recorded his interview with her. However, this was not presented at court. Neither was the CCTV footage from the hotel that placed Gu Kai Lai at the hotel on the night of the murder. The betrayal was intense, as Wang Lejun had been close to the family since 2007 with the case of Gu Kai Lai's mercury poisoning. After the investigation, he became a trusted protector. He was placed in charge of all Gu Kai Lai's medication and kept a close eye on her doctors. And besides that, working for Bo Xi Lai boosted his career tremendously. For someone as unconventional as Wang Lijun, having the title of police chief of a megacity would be virtually impossible under any other leader. So why would Wang Lijun then turn on his former boss and his wife? People close to Wang said that he always felt like someone was out to get him. He could not sleep. He was even investigated for corruption in 2010. He was paranoid to the point that his secretary had to sip his tea before he would drink it and take a bite of his food before he would eat. He feared someone was hatching a plan to poison him. But in 2011, he suddenly seemed to be less concerned about any political pressure. Is it possible that he struck a deal with influencers of the Communist Party? A deal that would absolve him from his alleged offenses if he was prepared to destroy Bo Xilai? Because he sought asylum at the American consulate, Wang Lijun was seen as a traitor by the Communist Party. This meant he faced the harshest form of punishment, the death penalty. He was charged with defection, abuse of power, and taking bribes. Fortunately for him, he only received a 15-year prison sentence and a one-year suspension from the party. That is only one year. Wang had friends in high places, and the fact that he was not kicked out of the party for good made people wonder about what Wang Lijun knew. And ultimately, 
what really happened to Neil Haywood. An alternative theory of what took place at the Lucky Holiday Hotel was that Gukai Lai met with Neil Haywood, but left when he was still alive. A third party entered through the hotel window and poisoned Neil Haywood by either forcing poison down his throat or poisoning Neil's water. Then, Wang Lejun twisted evidence to frame Gukai Lai for the murder with the main goal of disgracing her husband and his former boss, Bo Shi Lai. Some people believe that orders came straight from the top, the man that Bo Shi Lai was up against for eventual leadership of the Communist Party. Every 10 years, the Communist Party changes its leadership. Xi Jinping was about to become president, and it looked like Bo Shi Lai was coming in strong as a contender for one of the other seats. The fear was that the charismatic Bo Shi Lai, who came from a respected communist family, could have outshone Xi Jinping. Wang Lijun was placed under pressure to take Bo Xi Lai down. The party would destroy him if he wasn't prepared to frame his boss's wife for the murder of Neil Haywood. Wang Lijun went to Bo Xi Lai and asked for protection. But Bo was not prepared to stick his neck out for his police chief. Desperate, Wang Lijun resorted to blackmail. And that's when Bo punched him. Wang Lijun realized that Bo would have him killed, then cover up the murder and blame it on gangs in Chongqing. And if Bo Xi Lai didn't get to him first, he had to face the Communist Party. He had to make a plan urgently. That's when he went to the American consulate. In 2013, Bo Xi Lai was charged with corruption and abuse of power. He was found guilty and sentenced to life imprisonment. He was also stripped of all his assets. But Bo Xi Lai feels that this won't be his final chapter. In a letter published by South China Morning Post, he mentioned the fact that his father went to prison before he became a national hero. Bo strongly believes that he will be vindicated. I will wait quietly in the prison. My father was jailed many times. I will follow his footsteps. Both Bo Xi Lai and Gu Kai Lai are held at undisclosed locations. Their son Gua Gua went on to study at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. Photos of him as a party animal playboy does not go down well with Chinese officials. The family claims that money from Gu Kai Lai's time as a lawyer supports the young man and his international jet-set lifestyle. But the Bo family name is one that will always be synonymous with Chinese politics, and all eyes are on Gua Gua, wondering if he'll ever go back to China and throw his hat into the ring as well. Neil Haywood's family requested compensation from Gu Kai Lai after his death. Neil was the breadwinner of the family, and his wife was left to raise their daughters herself in the wake of the tragedy. Chinese authorities never responded to the family's request. If you'd like to read more about this case, have a look at the resources used for this episode in the show notes. Also visit and like our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash evidence locker podcast to see more about today's case. Also join our Facebook group and chat with other listeners about other cases that we have covered. And if you like our podcast, please subscribe in Apple Podcast or Stitcher or wherever you get your podcasts. We would also appreciate it if you could review the episodes as it gives us some street cred in the world of podcasting. While you're waiting for our next episode, why not listen to one of our podcasting friends? Do you like true crime, mysteries, or urban legends, and maybe anything along the lines of weird? If your answer is yes, please give the Asian Madness podcast a go, where I cover all of the topics mentioned above, but from the Asian continent. Podcast is now available on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and wherever you listen to podcasts. This was The Evidence Locker. Thank you for listening.